Good evening and thank you for joining tonight's presentation hosted by the City and County of Denver. My name is Vanita Curry and I'm going to be your moderator tonight as we talk about the Community Transportation Network in South Central Denver. I'd like to invite Nora to welcome our Spanish speakers. Nora. Buenas noches, damas y caballeros. Bienvenidos a la reunión pública de esta noche. Estamos uh, transmitiendo simultáneamente en español. Si usted desea o prefiere escuchar esta información en español, por favor presione asterisco cero en su teléfono. Gracias. Thanks, Nora. Now let's introduce your panelists for tonight. I am joined by two transportation experts from the city and county of Denver that you'll be hearing from shortly, including Ellen Forhofer and Sam Piper. They are both from the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. We're also joined by other transportation experts from the city and a team of consultants who will be helping to answer your questions during our Q&A sessions. Welcome team. I'd like to now invite Sam to say a few words. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. I wanted to note that I've been the project manager for the South Central Community Transportation Network, and I'm moving on to a new role within the Department of Transportation Infrastructure. So this evening, we'll be in, um, we will be introducing our new project manager, Ellen Forthoffer. So you're in great hands, and, and again, um, look, thank you so much for everyone's involvement. So I just wanted to give you that quick update um, in terms of the project manager and Benita, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks so much, Sam. If this is your first time joining us, welcome and thank you. You can catch up on what you've missed by viewing our previous meeting recordings on the project's website at bit.ly forward slash Denver Moves Networks. If you have joined us before, welcome back. Some of you are joining us through your computers or on your phone for tonight's meeting. If you have dialed in by phone, but you would like to see the PowerPoint presentation, grab a paper and pen and write down this web address, www.ctnvirtualopenhouse.com and follow along. This is not required to, re to attend our meeting. And you might see a slight delay as we click through our slides. So no worries there. Let me tell you a little bit about how to provide feedback during tonight's meeting. If you are watching online, you can double click the frame to make the presentation larger. If you would like to ask our panel a question, those of you on the phone can press star three on your keypad and you will be connected to an operator who will ask you some basic information before putting you in the queue to ask your question directly to our panel. Those of you participating online can type your question into the question box on the website. If you're viewing the presentation in full screen, you may have to minimize back to normal view in order to access the question box. We will be monitoring the chat box and your phone calls to forward your questions to the project team during our time together. You can begin now to enter your questions and throughout our community meeting. Now let's take a look at the meeting agenda. We have divided tonight's meeting into three sections with plenty of breaks for Q&A. First, we'll provide an overview of the community transportation network and our planning process to help you understand the timeline for projects that you're tracking. We'll stop for questions before we move on to give you step-by-step -step instructions on how you can access important information on our updated website. We'll take another pause to welcome your questions, and then we will share a spotlight on our shared street initiative and take a closer look at some key projects you'll have a final chance to ask another round of questions before we wrap up with a quick reminder on how you can stay engaged. I'd like to invite Ellen to start us off. Ellen? Thank you, Vanita. Good evening and thank you all so much for joining us tonight. 
As Vanita mentioned, my name is Ellen Forthofer, and I am the project manager for the South Central Community Network within the Denver Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. It's a pleasure to be here tonight to, dis to discuss the Community Transportation Network with you. Between now and 2023, Denver will be concentrating in three areas of the city to implement a strong network of bikeways. We are calling these areas the Central, Northwest, and South Central Community Transportation Network areas. Saudi has funding to implement 125 miles of bikeways over the next three years to provide more travel options for Denverites. While most of our conversation tonight will be focused on safety improvements for people biking and walking, these improvements will make it safer for everyone who travels on the street, no matter what mode of transportation you choose. Tonight, we'll be highlighting some of the key projects in the South Central part of the network, which is comprised of 12 neighborhoods with downtown Denver as the northern boundary, the Platte River as the western boundary, the southern boundary of Denver to the south, and Franklin and University Streets as the eastern boundary. This is a very large area that has a lot of impactful projects that will be implemented over the next few years to create a stronger and more connected network for Denverites to get around. Now let's take a look at our bike planning process. For those of you on the phone, we're looking at a slide that illustrates how projects move through our implementation process. Each corridor has its own timeline, which means projects move through this process at their own pace and can be in various stages along the planning process. This process has five steps. First, we begin by confirming the bike network. In other words, we confirm the route the bikeway will take. Then we develop options and share them with the community. After that, we develop a concept design for community input. Then the design is refined and completed based on community feedback and additional data analysis. Finally, the project moves into the construction phase for implementation. As I mentioned before, projects move through these steps at different paces. Let's talk about where two groups of projects currently are in the process. Tonight, the projects that we are referring to as phase one projects are the ones that have already completed the first three stages of our planning process. These projects are now moving through the design refinement process and will be heading into construction anticipated later this year in 2021. On the next slide, we'll take a look at where phase two projects fall on our planning process timeline. These projects that we're referring to as phase two are new corridors that have just begun the planning process and are moving into the concept development stage. We need your input as a community to help us finalize these designs and make sure that we have projects that best suit each neighborhood's unique needs and concerns. Our phase two are planned for construction in 2022, and we have surveys launching tonight that we'll talk about later uh, for each of these corridors. Let's look at the next slide to discuss the program milestones. For those of you on the phone, we're looking at a graphic that shows our program milestones for the South Central Community Network as three primary phases. There's the planning phase, the design phase, and the construction phase. As I'm sure you're all aware, due to COVID-19, we had to shift to virtual engagement and have been hosting online meetings with our stakeholder working group as well as community meetings. And we are providing online surveys and virtual office hours. All three phases rely on community feedback. This meeting tonight is one of several opportunities for community members to provide feedback and to ask us questions. I'd also like to, I'd like to encourage you to take our concept design surveys, which are launching tonight for certain phase two corridors. Please help us promote these surveys to your neighbors and friends as these are new projects and they need your input to help refine them. We'll talk more about these surveys and other information available for projects later in tonight's meeting. But, to, but first we wanted to give an overview of our public involvement and engagement efforts to date. Early last year, we launched an interactive map tool and asked community members how it felt to walk, bike and drive in the South Central Network. We used that information to identify where there were challenges for mobility today and opportunities for improvement tomorrow. 
Then over the summer, we began to advance which corridors we would make improvement on and launched a series of surveys. Those surveys were used to both verify the network and make sure we were making the right investments on the right streets. And we also used them to verify conceptual ideas for specific improvements. More than 3,000 community members responded to those surveys. In addition to those online tools, we've hosted a series of community meetings. We've had over 1,000 people attend our virtual meetings and offered more than 60 virtual office hour sessions with the project team. Now, I'd like to pause for our first Q&A session, uh, and so I'll toss it to Vanita. Vanita? Thanks so much, Ellen. For those of you who joined us late, good evening, and thank you for joining tonight's virtual public meeting hosted by the City and County of Denver. My name is Vanita Curry. For those of you who would like to ask the panel uh, team some questions, now is your opportunity. If you are using your phone to participate in tonight's discussion, you can, um, you can enter your question by pressing star three on your keypad. You will be transferred to an operator who will take down some basic information before putting you in the queue to ask your question. For those of you connected by your computer, you can type in your question in the question box on the meeting webpage at www.ctnvirtualopenhouse.com. Well, let's get started with our first round of questions. Ellen, I'm gonna come back to you. I've got a question from Greg and he says, can Dottie explain the reason for diverting northbound traffic at 14th and Franklin? Thanks, Vanita, and thanks, Greg. That's a great question. So Greg is referring to one of the projects in the South Central Community Network area on North Franklin Street. Um, this is a corridor that stretches from Cheeseman Park to the south all the way north to 20th Avenue. Um, and part of this project involves implementing a neighborhood bikeway south of 17th Avenue on Franklin Street. And the neighborhood bikeway is a little bit different. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this facility later in the presentation today, um, but it's a shared condition for people biking uh, as well as people driving on the street. And there are also intersection improvements that help people walking on the corridor as well. And part of those design improvements involve keeping traffic volumes and speeds lower. And so there is a proposed traffic diverter at 14th and Franklin which makes um, the traffic on North Franklin Street uh, primarily local. That helps to keep those volumes low and help to make it um, a really strong shared condition for people biking on the street, um, both in the future. Thanks so much, Ellen. I wanna uh, put in one more question. This one's gonna go to Sam. I'm uh, not sure the person's name, but the question is, can you let us know if there are changes being made to 11th between Emerson and Pearl? Hi, Vanita. Yes, that's a great question. And so um, one of the projects that we're going to be talking about tonight is a new alignment along um, Emerson and Pearl Street, uh, where we would provide a, a great connection north-south in the Capitol Hill neighborhood. And yes, we do have some proposed improvements that we're contemplating. And those can be found in what we're calling the conceptual map, um, which shows the improvements. And um, Ellen is actually going to talk about how folks can access that map. But just to give you a kind of a sneak peek of what that would look like, we're thinking about actually creating some curb extensions, which would shorten the crossing distance at um, 11th and Emerson and 11th and Pearl, and also help to slow speeds as vehicles turn around those corners and, and increase the visibility of, of both bicyclists and pedestrians as they're crossing the street. So yes, we do have some um, ideas, but we need your feedback to determine if those ideas are in alignment with what the community thinks are important changes to the street. So please uh, take the survey for that project and look at the new information we've posted. Thank you, Vanita. Sure. I think we've got um, time for one more question this break. Um, I'm coming to you, Ashley, uh, with a question from Shonda. And the question is, when will we see the safety improvements on the Marion Parkway? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
And that design is, is all wrapped up 100% complete. And honestly, where we're at with that is just working on getting a contractor on board to actually build it. So the goal is to build it this year, hopefully over the summer. Um, and it's really just a matter of really boring um, behind the scenes contracting mechanisms that are taking a little longer than we anticipated. There's just a lot of construction work out there in Denver and our contractors are very busy. So um, we don't have a contractor on board today for me to give you an exact timeline, Shonda, but um, we're trying to get it out there as quickly as possible. Thanks so much, Ashley. And thank you everyone for those great questions. We have two more Q&A breaks. So if you haven't submitted your question online or you haven't called in to ask your question, please do so now so we can answer your questions later tonight. Let's bring it back to Ellen to walk us through the next few slides. Ellen. Thanks, Vanita. Now let's talk about project updates and construction phasing. Phase one projects, again, are the projects that are now refining designs and are anticipated to start construction in 2021. We have quite a number of phase one projects that we anticipate to install over 2021 and 2022. Um, those projects number 17 corridors uh, and just over 22 lane miles of new facilities. Looking at the map to the right, if you're joining online and can see the slides tonight, everything that has a yellow highlight behind it are projects that are anticipated to start construction later this year. We're really excited to think about how this will impact the connectivity of the network overall. Now let's talk about phase two projects. Additional corridors that we are planning for improvements uh, that are anticipated to start construction in 2022. The phase two projects are staggered behind phase one projects, and some of them already have concept designs. Others will be introducing tonight uh, and with the concept surveys. These changes represent almost 23 lane miles of improvements, a big change for what it means to get around if you are choosing to bike or walk. You can visualize how all of these improvements play together on, to, on the map to the left. Um, any line that has a purple highlight behind it is planned for implementation in 2022 as a phase two project. On the next slide, we'll talk about, uh, we have new information for both phase one and phase two projects. If you go to the project website at bit.ly, slash Denver Moves Networks, you will have the opportunity to click for information about existing conditions, FAQs, or frequently asked questions for each corridor, and you can review information about our next community meetings and opportunities to stay involved. That's all for phase one projects. Phase two projects uh, are also available on the website. Um, you can use the website to learn more about these projects that are in earlier stages of the community network process. We invite you to explore the conceptual improvement maps for these corridors and take our design concept surveys to provide your feedback on the corridors you care about most. Now let's talk through the list of phase two projects. Can we actually go to the next slide, please? Thank you. This is a list of phase two projects that will be entering the concept design phase. We need your input to help us design a plan that fits your community. Please be sure to take the concept surveys. For those of you on the phone, those projects are South Sherman Street, East Florida Avenue, South Franklin Street, North Emerson and North Pearl Streets, North Sherman Street, and East Second Avenue. You can find all of the information on these projects as well as the surveys by going to the project website at bit.ly slash Denver Moves Networks. Then you can click on the documents folder to access that information. Let's walk through exactly how we can access the information on the website. We wanted to dedicate time tonight to make sure everyone knew how to find this information on the newly updated project website. This is a brief tutorial for how to access information for all South Central projects. After entering the web address bit.ly slash Denver Moves Networks, you will see the option to click the South Central Denver link. Once you click the hyperlink for South Central, scroll down to the Projects tab. Click Projects. 
Once you click projects, it will reveal a list of all of the corridors planned for 2021 and 2022 in stock. This shows the neighborhood the facility is in, the type of bikeway that is planned, and the project status. Select the corridor you'd like to review and click the Documents tab, which is hyperlinked at the far right. This will direct you to a variety of documents for the neighborhood of your choice. Corridors that have surveys will also have a survey link. Once you click the Documents tab, you will see uh, files for all of the information that we have available for that corridor. This includes existing conditions reports, conceptual improvement maps, frequently asked questions, as well as surveys for applicable corridors. These materials have been provided to help, help you keep pace with the various projects underway. Now we're gonna pause again for our second Q&A session. Uh, so I'll kick it back to Vanita. Vanita? Thanks, Ellen. Well, this is your turn to ask us some questions. If you wanna participate and you've called in using your phone, press star three on your keypad You'll be transferred to an operator. We'll take down some basic information before they put you in the queue to ask your question. Those of you connected by your computer can also type your question into the question box on the meeting webpage at www.ctnvirtualopenhouse.com. Uh, let's get to your questions. I'm, I'm actually gonna go uh, to get someone who's called in their question. And Brett, this is gonna come to you. Uh, Karen is concerned about the accessibility for people in wheelchairs. So let's hear what her question no, is. Karen, Karen, are you there? Yes, it was actually um, using Accessoride and having to use the lift with Accessoride. Because I already, so I already had problems. I've had, already mm -hmm. had problems getting onto Accessoride by the Performing Arts Complex because they had to go out and go into an intersec intersection to be able to use the, the lift. So your they concern is about having, yeah. So your your concern is about accessibility with the intersection. Is that correct? Well, I'm worried about Accessoride's ability to pick someone up who needs the the, the lift. Who can't go up the stairs and has to use the lift? I, like I said, I was at the Performing Arts Complex last year, and I called AI. You know, was ready for Access Ride. I cannot see, so I didn't know there was the barrier there. And they had, thank God, it's a T intersection. I had to go into the middle of the inter intersection. Oh, well, I think I understood that Karen yeah, Brett was concerned. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that's a great. Question, Karen, and I can kind of speak to at least where we come from, from when we do bikeway projects like we're, we're talking about here. Um, for the bikeway projects themselves from a general accessibility and pedestrian standpoint, these bikeway projects actually, uh, we, we see them as uh, multifold, I guess, when it comes to addressing not only bike concerns, but pedestrian concerns, particularly at the intersection. So. What you will probably see in a lot of the plans is is pedestrian improvements like bulb outs and things like that that reserve more space at the intersections for pedestrians. Now, to your specific question, I do understand you're 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 asking about accessoride, um, which is you know definitely RTD, and I think there might be some specific um, things that we can discuss. And I would be curious to know the specific location, and it probably is good for us to discuss that offline. Um, and so uh, hopefully we can get your information and, and or, or you can get our information to ask us that question specifically and we can help you resolve the concern you have with the Accessoride issues. Thank you so much, Brett. Sam, I'm coming to you with a question. Um, I don't have the name of the person, but um, can Denver explain how it was decided to install neighborhood bikeways and not protected bike lanes. It seems like the car and bike conflicts are still going to be there. Avenida, that's a great question. And we're actually gonna get into a little bit more information about how we pick the right type of bikeway depending on the traffic volume and the speed of a street. And one of the things we really wanna emphasize is that as speed and traffic volumes increase, we need to have 
more protection between uh, where bicycles are riding and where vehicles are driving. And, and research does suggest that that creates a safer street. What the research also shows is that on local streets where we have low traffic volumes and low speeds and low speeds correlated with, with, with increased safety for pedestrians and bicyclists and less passing events between um, folks like bicycles who are uh, using the street and drivers, um, then we can create equally safe streets. We can create high comfort conditions for bicyclists and pedestrians and drivers on, an, on a neighborhood bikeway type setting. So um, we, we really want to make sure that we're using the right tool given a, a particular street's context. And we'll talk more about how Dottie uses speed and volume to influence um, uh, bikeway type uh, later in this presentation. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, Brad, I'm coming back to you with one more question for this break. Um, the question is, I think, from Alex, and uh, it's, this question is, can you address how the design at transitions and intersections will be made safer? Uh, the caller or the chat box person is concerned about the underpass at I-25, 8th, 13th, and Walnut. Sure, yeah, and if I, um, if I understand Alex's question here, kind of, related to you know outside of the south central network how are we connecting to the areas it sounds like mostly to the west like under i-25 over i-25 things like that um great question and and something that obviously the city we are paying attention to and have quite a few efforts underway outside of this south central community network that we're talking about today so for instance there um, is a project that we have on our radar for the alameda underpass um, uh, speaking of Alameda, um, 13th Avenue that you mentioned as well, um, uh, we had a, uh, a protected uh, bike lane project that uh, went in there and is being extended even further to the west to Decatur through uh, the Denver Housing Authority uh, uh, development project that's happening in Sun Valley. Um, we also have a project happening on 8th Avenue and in all these projects that I'm mentioning are, are, I will say, separate than this one. You know, we kind of divided up the city in kind of chunks, um, knowing, though, that we had these different point-loaded connections to go, say, to the west. And so we do have all these other projects, but they're just not part of this um, particular uh, bikeway community network, if, if that makes sense. Um, I think we also have a bridge coming in from uh, the Broadway station redevelopment that is down near uh, I-25 and Broadway and things of that nature. So those are those are kind of dealt with on a on a project by project basis. But good question. Thanks so much, Brett. Um, Ellen, I want to come back to you. We've got a person on the line, uh, Pat, and they have a question about Emerson and Pearl Street and the impacts to parking. So I'm going to bring Pat on the line. Pat, are you there? Hello. Yes. Hi, Pat. You're live with our uh, panelists. Please ask your question. Okay. Um, the area over here between, I say, Logan or Broadway, whatever, and going east uh, probably for a mile or two, but particularly uh, we, we answered a survey here, I believe, last year or the year before regarding uh, Emerson and Clarkson, um, you know, taking out uh, parking spots um, from around 12th or 13th down south down to Spear. And boy, the city has allowed us, has allowed the developers to build all of these huge, humongous apartment buildings, and they're all around this whole area. We, we can't spare any parking spaces because, you know, five or six o'clock at night, they're all filled up, and sometimes during the day. I want to know and be assured one way or the other that you are not going to try to take out those spaces in order to put in 
just a park, a bicycle lane uh, in that area. Okay, um, so Ellen, I'm gonna give that question to you. Thank you, Pat, so much for your question. Yes, thanks, Pat. Great question, uh, and you are correct. We did have a survey earlier last year um, that asked several things, you know, and, and part of the feedback we heard uh, on that survey was a, a strong concern about uh, potential parking removal uh, for safety improvements that were initially proposed in Denver Moves, uh, the city's bicycle master plan on Washington and Clarkson streets. And we do have more information later in the presentation um, about exactly where, um, where we're going with that, but I do just wanna highlight uh, because of that feedback, as well as some additional data analysis, our project team uh, analyzed several alternatives for a strong north-south connection through Cap Hill. And we will actually be moving forward with a neighborhood bikeway on North Emerson and North Pearl streets. Um, and that does allow us to maintain uh, most of the parking. Um, there might be some slight exceptions at intersections, um, as we all know in Cap Hill, as well as several neighborhoods in the city. Um, sometimes parking is so close to intersections, it creates some visibility issues. Um, so I, I don't wanna say there will be no parking impacts. There may still be some parking impacts uh, with a neighborhood bikeway installation, um, but that is um, a, a much smaller number and we're still able to get the strong uh, multimodal benefits of uh, an improved connection for people biking and walking throughout the area. So we're really excited uh, that we were able to find um, a good alternative uh, that so far has strong community support uh, but do just want to highlight that um, that additional information and uh, all of the information of how we made that transition um, to this corridor and that we'll be moving forward with is available online at our project website at bit.ly slash Denver Moves Networks. And there's actually a survey available for the North Pearl, North Emerson connection. Um, where we're asking for community feedback on specifics of that design. So I encourage you, as well as other neighbors who are interested in that connection, uh, to, to please take that survey and review the information we have available online. Thank you, Ellen, I appreciate that. I do wanna squeeze in one more question to Sam, um, and it is from Rob, and he says, the changes made on Bayot are outstanding for pedestrians. Are there further changes planned to improve bike safety? Hey, Vanita, um, that's, a, that's another great question. And Rob, thank you for that. And uh, I feel like a lot of the questions are kind of precursors to some more information we're gonna talk about, but to give you a, a little bit of a heads up and answer your question is, um, yes, we are planning more improvements to Bayad Street. And so Bayad Street is, is a shared street that was implemented due to the COVID-19 pandemic to increase social distancing on several streets across Denver. And as we'll discuss, it was a very successful um, pilot during the summer to, to increase space for people to recreate safely in, in, in a socially distanced um, space. So um, co coincidentally, it's also a neighborhood bikeway that was moving forward through the South Central community transportation network. And through this opportunity, the fact that it was a shared street, we were actually able to implement um, just in the month of January, changes that were recommended through the full neighborhood bikeway design. And so folks have been out there, we've made a traffic modification at Lincoln and Bayad, we've made a traffic modification at Emerson and Bayad, and we've implemented uh, curb extensions at several intersections, such as the intersection with Pennsylvania. Um, because this was an interim step, um, we, we weren't able to implement all of the proposed improvements. And so know that the, uh, the design does include intersection modifications at Logan and Bayad, as well as a, a new traffic circle. Uh, traffic circles are intended to slow vehicles as they travel the corridor, creating a safer street for everyone. We also have a proposed improvement where Bayad intersects Downing. So, so yes, Rob, we do have more changes um, on, on the horizon for Bayad, really oriented at improving bicycle safety, but also improving safety for anyone 
who's using the street, whether you're a pedestrian or you're driving or you're rolling down the corridor. Thank you, Sam. And thank you everyone for those wonderful questions. Really good thinking on your behalf. So thank you. I'm actually gonna toss it right back to you, Sam, uh, to lead us through the next couple of slides. Awesome. Well, thank you, Vanita. And as some of the questions came through again, I'm just trying going to emphasize some of the points that we were able to uh, kind of mention during the question and answer. But Dottie is making safer streets across the South Central network. We have different ways to make safer streets, and that's really dependent upon how fast vehicles are traveling today and, and what the traffic levels are along these streets. And the different tools that we have include creating dedicated bike lanes or separated bike lanes, which means that there's a physical barrier between where people can bike and where vehicles are driving. And then another bikeway type is, is what we call neighborhood bikeways. And one of the themes that Ellen has mentioned through the presentation is that while bicycles is a consistent theme of, um, of all of these different facility types, Research suggests that all of these improvements make it safer for everyone who travels on the street, whether they are walking, rolling, or even driving a vehicle. So when we talk about safe street improvements to provide dedicated space or a shared space for bicycles, what we're really talking about is making the street safer for everyone. And now let's dive in a little bit more into a new facility type in Denver, which is called a neighborhood bikeway. We had a question about that during the, the Q&A. We want to provide a little bit more detail about what a neighborhood bikeway looks like. And so neighborhood bikeways are not a new concept nationally. In fact, many cities across the country have well-established neighborhood bikeway networks. But that said, it is a fairly new street type in Denver. Many of the projects that we're implementing in phase one and in phase two that Ellen talked about will become neighborhood bikeways. So what are the building blocks of a neighborhood bikeway? First, we wanna make it easy um, for pedestrians and bicycles to travel on these streets. Second, we want to brand the streets so that people know that there are safe, slow, low traffic streets. And we accomplish this with wayfinding signage as well as pavement markings. And one of the things we're really excited about is that on our uh, neighborhood bikeways, we're actually going to be unveiling Denver specific neighborhood bikeway wayfinding signage. And you will be able to tell what these signs are because it will have two little bears on top of the sign. And that's going to help people understand that this is a neighborhood bikeway and it is a safe and slow street to walk or bike along. Another major element of neighborhood bikeways are street changes that decrease traffic speed, so create slower streets. And uh, changes include curb extensions that shorten crossings and slow turning vehicles or uh, traffic circles. And again, these are designed to create a slower street. And just note that we have other tools in our toolbox to make sure speeds along these streets remain slow. Lower local traffic is also linked to safer streets for all. Now, neighborhood bikeways, if traffic is above a certain level today, we can implement changes to manage vehicle traffic and really prioritize those local trips so that it becomes a safer street for pedestrians and bicyclists. Let's talk a little bit more about what these changes look like on our next slide. And so as we discussed during the Q&A with that question about Bayad, we were actually able to leverage a really unique partnership with the Shared Street Initiative pilot that Dottie rolled out early last year, just as the pandemic was beginning. As people who may have seen this street or other streets throughout the city of Denver, these pilots created space within our streets for people to recreate and to be outside in a safe and socially distanced way. Many of the building blocks for a neighborhood bikeway are what we look at in terms of creating a shared street to create a safe condition for everyone to share that space. 
And on this slide, you can see that there's actually a quick overview of what these, uh, what, what this program looked like overall. And this initiative, again, was part of our COVID-19 response, and it really was focused on, focused on prioritizing local vehicle trips so that those trips could still happen, but also slowing vehicles to create a safer environment for all people. And we just recognized that as we rolled these um, projects out, we had a tremendous rate of success. So we collected data all over the summer to really understand if and how these shared streets were working. And we're really excited to see the success story behind this data. Some of the points that we wanted to highlight we saw that over 10,000 people a day were using the st shared streets during the summer. So if people are, are, are joining on the phone, there's a map that shows all of the shared streets we had across Denver, and again, 10,000 people per day using those streets. The percentage of people walking or rolling on these streets increased by 280%. And well, as we tried to prioritize those local vehicle trips, we saw total vehicle trips go down 77% lower. And on average, vehicle speeds decreased as well. And we saw 28% lower speeds on these streets. Because of these initial results, we were able to leverage a unique opportunity on Bayad Ave. And we talked a little bit about that during the Q&A. And Ellen, would you mind diving into the details of what those changes looked like? Yeah, thanks, Sam, happy to. So East Bayad Avenue was part of the Shared Street Initiative, and it's also a corridor that was being looked at and designed as part of the South Central Community Network. The Bayad Shared Street saw the amount of people bicycling increase by nearly 130% over the summer, and vehicle traffic decreased along with vehicle speeds. As Sam mentioned, we were trying to prioritize local trips and keep the trips that were on Bayad moving slower than they were before the improvements of the shared street. So I just wanted to highlight a few pictures of this opportunity we were able to leverage to uh, take our design efforts from the South Central Community Network um, and install them a little bit sooner than we originally anticipated. Uh, there will be more improvements coming to Bayad, as Sam mentioned in the Q&A session. Um, but just want to highlight, if you're joining us online, you can see the picture to the left uh, is at Bayad and Lincoln. Um, we have a picture of a traffic diverter here. This helps us to keep the trips of, of vehicles on the street locally based. This is one of the first of this variety that we've installed in the city. And by limiting through traffic across Lincoln, we can keep traffic volumes low and trips local on Bayad Avenue. Again, if you're viewing us or, or if you're joining us online, you can see the picture to the right is a picture of the intersection at Bayad and Pennsylvania. This is an example of curb extensions that increase visibility and decrease crossing distance for people who are walking and biking. This also helps to flag for everyone using the street to be aware of uh, all users um, and really make sure you're looking for all modes of travel uh, at a slower pace. So these are just two examples of some of those building blocks of neighborhood bikeways. And we were able to install them a little bit sooner than we had originally anticipated on East Bayot Avenue because of a unique partnership with the Shared Street Initiative. And on the next slide, I'll start to go through just a few of the major project updates we wanted to talk about. Um, some of the updates that have come about since our last meeting uh, in the fall. And again, just wanna highlight all of the information that we're talking about tonight is available on our project website. That's at bit.ly slash Denver Moves Networks. So first, I want to talk about um, some uh, big crossing projects that we have identified. Through our outreach over the past year, we heard a lot from folks about difficulty crossing busy streets or other barriers in the neighborhood. Uh, one of those crossings is across Spear uh, at the Clarkson 2nd Ave and 3rd Ave intersection. What we heard there was a strong need to connect to the Cherry Creek Trail and provide a safe crossing uh, across Spear Boulevard. So as a result, we're proposing to extend our projects on 3rd Ave 
in Pearl Street uh, to provide a strong connection to the Cherry Creek Trail and also reduce conflict points at that crossing of Spear. Another crossing that I want to talk about is a little bit further south. It's across I-25 at Logan, Mississippi, um, and Logan and Mississippi streets. Uh, we heard here that there was a strong need to get across the I-25 bridge and provide a strong north-south connection between West Wash Park and Platte Park neighborhoods. Our proposal connects our projects on Kentucky Avenue uh, and Sherman Street by installing protected bike lanes on Logan Street in Mississippi to make a strong connection. And on the next slide, I'll talk through our projects on 3rd Avenues and 2nd Avenue. So through our community outreach efforts for 3rd Avenue, we heard some concerns about parking removal, as well as concerns about high traffic destinations that needed to be considered uh, along the corridor. We also conducted additional analysis that highlighted challenges with the width of the street, the traffic volumes, and the speeds. As a result of all of those inputs, we are proposing a switch from bike lanes on 3rd Avenue and are now moving forward with a project for a neighborhood bikeway on 2nd Avenue. This change still provides a strong east-west bike connection. Uh, there are lower traffic volumes on 2nd Avenue, so there's little to no traffic diversion needed in the design. And the ability to leverage the existing median refuges at Logan and 2nd um, and the existing signals at 2nd and Broadway and 2nd and Lincoln also help to make this a really strong project uh, as we can leverage infrastructure that's already there in our designs. Also want to highlight that neighborhood bikeways, which is what we are proposing on 2nd Avenue, they largely allow for parking to be maintained across the corridor with some small exceptions near intersections uh, to improve visibility. Now let's look at some corridors in Cap Hill. I know we talked about this a bit in the Q&A session. A north-south connection through Capitol Hill is an essential link in the network uh, to complete it and create strong connections throughout Denver. Initially, we explored the recommendation for protected bikeways on Washington and Clarkson streets uh, to strengthen the network. This is recommended in Denver Moves Bikes. Our, through our process, we heard community feedback uh, with several concerns about safety and on-street parking removal on those streets. Um, given that feedback, as well as additional analysis, we worked hard to look at alternative routes uh, and considered eight total options to make a strong north-south connection through Capitol Hill. Through that process, we were able to find a solution with strong community support by switching to a new route using Emerson, 11th Avenue, and Pearl Street as a neighborhood bikeway. As you will see on the next slide, this gives a good connection to Cherry Creek Trail uh, via 3rd Avenue, and it also provides a high comfort and intuitive connection that's already being used by several community members. It improves crossings at busy intersections across the corridor, uh, and it also reduces the total parking removal in the neighborhood um, and connects to Alamo Placida Park, as well as other neighborhood destinations. This is a perfect example of how community feedback is helping to shape the development of a strong and complete network. And again, I just wanna highlight, we do have a concept survey for this new proposal on North Emerson, 11th and Pearl Streets uh, that is available at our project website and is launched tonight. So we do encourage you all to take that and share additional feedback to help shape the exact design of that project. Now I'd like to send it over to Vanita for our final Q&A session. Vanita? Thanks, Ellen. Now let's get to your questions. Um, if you haven't asked your question yet, remember if you're calling in, press star three on your keypad to be connected to an operator. They'll take down basic information and then put you in the queue to ask your question. Those of you connected by computer can type in your question in the question box on the meeting webpage at www.ctnvirtualopenhouse.com. Now, let's get to your questions. I'm gonna to come to you, Sam. I've got a question from Elizabeth. And the question is, as part of this process, 
Will there be an improvement to connect to Cheeseman Park? Hi, Elizabeth, thank you for that question. And so the answer is yes, we, we will have improvements to connect to Cheeseman Park. So one particular project is on the north side of Cheeseman Park. We are going to make an improvement along North Franklin Street. And so we discussed a little bit tonight, the shared streets. And so folks may have seen on the north side of Cheeseman Park, um, if you're traveling on North Franklin Street, there was a closure um, so that Bicycles and pedestrians could still use that street to enter the park, but uh, vehicles um, weren't able to access from that from that alignment. So we're working with parks to see if that um, in, that install can actually be implemented in a permanent condition through the North Franklin project. But know that we are really um, trying to coordinate a safer connection into the park from the north, um, and then. From the western side of Cheeseman Park. So one of our really exciting projects that's teed up to be installed in 2021 is East, East 7th Ave. And so East 7th Ave travels all the way from Broadway on the western side to William Street on the eastern side. And so William Street is a local street that goes north-south right into the southern end of Cheeseman Park. And 7th, um, 7th Ave is going to be a neighborhood bikeway, and we're really looking to prioritize low speeds and low traffic along that street to provide a really strong east-west link that people can take all the way over to Williams, and then they just have to travel one more block to the north, crossing 8th, and then entering Cheeseman Park. So yes, so we, we, we are excited about uh, two new connections to the park in the Capitol Hill neighborhood. Thank you so much, Sam. Ashley, I think this question is going to be for you. It's coming from Andy. And the question is, there are problems with snow and plowing the Cherry Creek bike path. Can this condition be improved? Yeah, thank you, Andy, for bringing this up. Um, we definitely want to make sure that our bike facilities are usable. So um, I'd say the number one thing is anytime that you notice that there are issues or it's not been plowed, please do contact 311. Um, you can call them and they will definitely make sure that our maintenance group is made aware of this. Um, and then in the meantime, I am actually writing an email as this meeting goes on uh, to make sure we properly understand who's responsible for the ongoing maintenance of that, whether it's the adjacent property owner, the country club, or Parks and Rec or whomever, to make sure we can try to make sure there's some consistent maintenance out there. So thank you for bringing that up, Andy, and we'll try to Stay on top of that. But again, please do anytime you notice there's an issue out there, contact 311. Thanks. Thank you, Ashley. Well, that concludes our third and final Q&A session. I want to thank everyone for your great questions and for your participation. Let's head it back over to Ellen for next steps. Ellen. Thanks, Vanita. And thank you all for making time tonight uh, to attend this meeting. We hope it was a helpful way to interact with the project team and get answers to your questions. I also hope you feel confident about how to navigate our updated website and access information about uh, the projects we discussed tonight, as well as several other projects in the South Central Community Network area. Please share what you've learned with your neighbors and your friends. We need your help by taking the new concept design surveys for corridors and encouraging others to join you in providing their feedback. And finally, I hope to see you again for our next community meeting uh, this spring. Thank you everyone for joining. We look forward to continuing to engage with you on the community transportation networks in the coming months. Until then, have a lovely night and please stay safe. Thank you.